with Mount Mujesi and the law of the sea. Um, some of you will recall that we celebrated uh, uh, Elizabeth Mambojesa's centenary in 2018, and I was going to actually hold up the book that we produced, just in case you've forgotten about it. I'm that one. Some of you have, uh, and that's uh, open source, you can download that whenever you want to. That was prepared by about uh, 90. 19 essays, and there are really 19 essays in this book. So they're written in such a way that they know, you know they're not three references every sentence, which makes it undigestible. Anyway, the key thing this evening is Tercet. Now, um, as I said, it was, or maybe I didn't say it, it was published by Brown, and certainly it's also open access. Now, the, uh, during that, that centenary, by the way, in 2018, we also had a, a, one of these pop-up exhibits that's in the in the foyer. So you'll see that when you are holding your drink uh, after this uh, presentation. Now, one of the things I have to do, I'm obligated to tell you that the exits are, what are the exits? Well, you, <laughs> you have to get out in a hurry, I suppose you could. Are those windows open? Maybe not, but you know how to get out. But the most more important than that are the washrooms. Out to the left, through the, through the doorway, turn the left. And you'll see a sign that says Washington. Now, um, my name is Mike Butler, so I probably should have said that before. I have the pleasure of being the director of IOI Canada um, with my colleagues, um, Madeline Coffin Smout, who couldn't be with us because of sort of COVID challenges, and Jennifer Barr, I think you met uh, earlier on, who is the finance officer. So it's a sort of three person operation. Now, at this point, I'd like to. Uh, uh, make a number of acknowledgements. Firstly, uh, Dalhousie University sits on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and we're all treaty people. Now, to the okay. too, too big to ignore I got it. TBTI, uh, we'd like to thank them and the Ocean Science Research Foundation for making this, pre this presentation this evening possible. So, TBTI and OSRF, thank you very much, Ratna. Looking at you. Um, to, to Dalhousie University, who have hosted us for what, 43 years, that's, um, that's fantastic to do that. And to our IT experts, Masood on my left, Kevin and Faith Abel sitting behind the camera up there. Thank you for being patient and sorting out this. I'm not sure whether we're live streaming at this point or not. We are, I'm getting a nod. So, now that's, that's fantastic. Now, can we, can we bring Tessa up? Can we get Tessa online? Yeah. She's probably listening and wondering why she can't see anybody. Yeah, I'm sure that she, she can hear us. She can hear us, but she can't see us. I can hear you. I can also see uh, you I, now. I, hi, Tessa. So, sorry for the delay. If you remember when we did this IT check two days ago, we had similar challenges. Now, so what I, what I would want you to do for me is to stop to share your screen so I can share mine. I think it would be much easier. Okay, um, it's going to happen now. If you can do that, that now, would be great. Masood, Masood is doing that as I talk. Okay. Um, now, as you will note from the program, Tosa currently works at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Now, I was thinking what KTH meant. Well, I'll tell you. I'm going to mispronounce this, Tosa, so correct me. Kumliga Techniska Hochschule. How's that, bro? Oh, yes, it's Scott, you know. <laughs> anyway, that, that's what the TCH, KTH stands for. Um, and she's a postdoctoral researcher in history of media and environment with a specific focus on the history of ocean governments and environment. IOI Canada had the pleasure of welcoming Tessa to Halifax on a number of occasions. And she was researching a book, a uh, book, not a book, a book. And Madeline, um, who knows many of the people associated with uh, this with Mambo Jersey, was helping to guide her to those, uh, those experts. So she had a, most of her research, was, a lot of her research was certainly done in, done in Halifax. So Tosa, oh, there you are. Good, good to see you. Um, we're ready for you to, uh, for your presentation. You've got your, your 10 or 12 minutes to set, as I told the audience, to set the ambience for the evening. All yours, sir. 
Thank you so much, Mike. I hope, I mean, I have a little bit of a bad sound here. I hope you can hear me. If you can't, you have to shout. So um, I know, because I can't really see you much, but I hope you can see me. I hope, uh, well, I guess I'm larger than life on that, <laughs> on that screen. So yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be here uh, tonight for you. For me, it's really late. Uh, I'm in Oslo. And yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the book uh, I wrote about Elizabeth Mann-Borgesa and the Law of the Sea. And uh, well, first of all, uh, we are in the 16th Elizabeth Mann-Borgesa lecture. But, so this is an exciting opportunity for someone like me who's been researching on her to talk. So thank you so much for the invitation. I'm super happy to be here. And um, yeah, I want to just jump right in. Uh, here we can see a picture of her. Some of you might have seen it. Uh, it's her in front of the uh, United Nations headquarters in New York. And while I was researching my book, I found out that she must have been an idealist at heart and a realist in practice because she worked very relentlessly for specific things uh, in the ocean. So I think, first of all, it's uh, fair to start this talk by saying kind of the ob obvious we wouldn't be here uh, tonight, near online in the room, without her. Um, yeah, without her work in Halifax and her own around the world. And this International Ocean Institute, of course, that, that hosts, hosts this event tonight wouldn't exist without her work. And I know that some of you who are in the room, I couldn't see you, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I would have loved to be, be there with you, but I know that some of you, maybe even many of you, might have worked with her, many of you know of her. And some of you uh, definitely knew her very well. So I'm, I, I know that and I'm humbled by that, of course. And um, as Mike uh, touched upon, I came to Halifax uh, for the first time in 2015 when I was doing um, a, a PhD about deep sea mining as an historian, which was a weird thing to do. And um, I ca came to, to look into how all the laws and regulations came about in the law of the sea. And then I found Elizabeth Mangorgesi and I was fascinated. And I found out that the Killen Library actually here the, has the Elizabeth Mangorgesi funds at the Dalhousie University Archives. So I went here. And um, some of you know that this um, library has all the letters and documents and the papers that she stored in her house by the sea. But she lived in the central head. And those of you who are from Halifax or from the region or from Canada know, know that house maybe. I visited it and it looks very different today. There was some um, very gray, you know, the, the kind of the, the wood has gone gray and a little little run down, but at the time when she lived there, as you can see from the photo here that was taken by her her um, daughter, Nika Bot, yes, it was very beautiful at the time and she, she lived there with what, everything I think between four and seven dogs at the time. So um, the documents uh, that were left there when she died in 2002 were all kind of carried over to the Killam Library. And then I went in as a PhD student and, and start look, started looking through them. And the people working there told me, well, we have like about 50 meters of shelf space with all her papers and documents and letters. And it just is a um, proof of, of her relentless work and all the things that she's done uh, during this uh, her lifetime uh, working with world governance questions and then moving over to ocean governance and you know setting up the IOI and water first and then in Halifax and all over the world. So all that was, um, and of course there's more, uh, but most of, of her, her belongings are still there in, in the library. So I went there and I worked with that and went through it. And of course there's still much more to do with this, is something I always want to say. Um, there's a lot of very important correspondence, I think, with a lot of diplomats and other activists working with the North the Sea Convention that still needs to be looked at. I've only looked at a fraction of that. So that's a very important uh, thing I want to want to kind of point out. So this is the book I've, I've seen uh, Mike kind of waving around, which is really nice, thank you. And uh, what I did in there was I tried to study uh, how ideas for political improvement and change can, can change through time and travel through institutions and how social and political and governmental and environmental events shape the ideas and ideas of individuals. And for Elizabeth Mangorgesi, that may, meant that the, uh, the idea she had was to apply the common heritage of mankind to the deepest part of the ocean 
that didn't belong to any state, so the Bosch flaw outside of national jurisdiction. And that's a very um, idealistic goal, um, which he worked very relentlessly for during the Law of the Sea Convention, but also before and after. So I didn't only look at the years from 1973 to 1982, where like, this, uh, uh, the, the third United Nations Law of the Sea Convention took place in New York, which he was then uh, uh, traveling to uh, a lot. But also the years uh, before when she prepared for that, and the years after when they prepared the International Seaman Authority. And what I found was, uh, first of all, that the book is kind of a history of ideas, how do ideas travel through international institutions. It's an interesting and important because ideas travel all the time through international institutions, and they turn into law, and you should know more about how people can influence um, legal uh, lawmaking and how ideas travel and how visions kind of turn into something real. Then I was very interested in legacies. What is left when someone um, puts a lot of their time and efforts into something like that, uh, like Elizabeth Manbridge, as they did? And um, I found that, of course, uh, part of the legacy is the IOI, for instance. And it's also uh, still doing um, training courses and, and being interested in technology transfer. And yeah, so that's the last thing. So this, what she did was she influenced um, the Law of the Sea Convention through institutions, I mean, and then one of those institutions is the IOI, which we are at tonight. And, and um, uh, what she did there was that uh, Elizabeth Member GSC came into the Law of the Sea Convention as an outsider. She was not a diplomat like her, her friend, um, Abi Pardo, uh, from, uh, who was a diplomat from Malta. She was uh, someone coming from the outside, and uh, so she had to have something to, to enter the negotiations with. So they funded that uh, International Ocean Institute actually as a seed for the to, to become uh, the, the what we know today as the International Seabed Authority on Mars. It didn't work out. What worked out was to use the IOI as, as an NGO to enter the discussions. And only later, when NGOs weren't allowed to speak anymore because she was very uh, adamant and spoke up a lot, uh, that was changed, and she actually was able to to join an official uh, delegation, which was. The Austrian delegation. And then after, because she worked with um, implementing ideas uh, into the International Seabed Authority, it was still to be formed. And we know today that it's still under discussion. So there's just a few uh, things I want to say. I mean, I only have um, 10 minutes to talk about the almost 300 pages book, so this was hard. <laughs> but I want to say uh, two things that I think are important also politically, uh, a little bit more, not only about her as a person, but also the context she was working in. So in the 1960s, um, the, the international, uh, that, yeah, the world kind of community decided that the law of the sea had to be negotiated. And that was because of um, because one knew that there were problems and not use those um, mineral resources on the seafloor and the technology to mine those was thought to be on the horizon. And then this idea that Elizabeth Mambo Jesse and others said about the the common heritage of mankind was about redistributing the wealth uh, of the minerals on the sea floor to all nations, also developing nations. And that's because it was a time in which um, it was, first of all, after two world wars, uh, so negotiation was something in diplomacy, was diplomacy was something that, that the world community at large was interested in, but there was also a time of decolonialization, so there was a lot of um, nation states that kind of had emerged from this uh, international scene that wanted to have a say, and there was a lot of injustice in the world, like there is today, uh, about uh, wealth and distribution of wealth. So that was an idea to, to be more, to have a like, more uh, just ocean world order, was to take the revenue from those minerals and to, to give them to also developing states who didn't have the, the capacity to, to mine the deep sea in the deepest parts of the ocean themselves. So that was kind of the core idea of the common heritage. It didn't turn out the, exactly the way it is with Mambo Jesse and also Abi Pardo. You can actually see him here in the picture. I found that in the archive, the Abi Pardo archive in Malta. And he's in the middle. Maybe I can show you here he's sitting. Maybe you can see my, you can maybe see my cursor. It's in the middle of the picture. So that's like at one of the United Nations General Assembly uh, meetings. I don't know when, because he had written it on the back of that photo um, in handwriting. 
um, that maybe about 1973-74, didn't write a date. So um, there you can see all the people working for uh, new uh, World Ocean Order, and Elizabeth Mambo Jesse was part of that, working for implementing the common heritage of mankind. And to give you a little teaser for the book, didn't work out the way she had wanted it or planned it uh, to work out the specifics um, of the common heritage of mankind that she had had wished, and also Arvind Kaur had wished to, to, to put into the law to see. Um, and there's a lot of drama around that, but there's also a lot of hope, and she still always worked for a better and more just ocean, uh, uh, and also world order. And what I would want to say today is maybe that um, at the time, uh, the environment wasn't discussed in a way that we would discuss it today, so sustainability and all those ideas were kind of new at the time, or not even exist is existing. But I think that today Elizabeth Mambo Jason would probably talk about the oceanic environment in a different way. And she would not only want justice for the common heritage of, of mankind, but maybe just the earth at large and all beings. So, yeah, without um, saying more, thank you so much for um, inviting me. And yeah, I hope maybe some of you would be interested in, in reading the book. I could only give you a glimpse of what I've done. I'm looking forward to all the other and um, the lecture, the keynote, and the discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tessa. Are you going to stay with us? Yeah, she's not. What is it? Right, it's fine. Thank you very much for your presentation. Much appreciated. And I will. Show them your book again, so don't worry. Good publicity. Now, um, I would like to introduce your moderator. Where is she? You're sitting, sitting quietly there. Uh, Dr. Chung Bagdi, as many of you will know, she's a pro professor in the Ge Geography Department at uh, Martin Mora University in Newfoundland. And I'm very proud to say that she was our first senior research fellow. We have now 11 of them, but Ratner was our most illustrious initial and uh, international, so we're very proud to have Ratna with us, and she's been with us for a number of years. Lectures regularly for us as well, which is fantastic, whether she's in Thailand or St. John's Newfoundland or here. Um, I'm not, we'll not go through all the degrees, etc. but she did get a PhD at the UB UBC, so uh, and I'm sure she knew Rashid when, he, when she was there. Um, now, Ratna leads a major global multi-million dollar research program entitled TBTI, that's too big to ignore, which is small-scale fisheries and it's a sort of global program, and a very exciting one. Uh, remember that this year is in fact the year of uh, small-scale fisheries and aquaculture. So it's most appropriate that we have Ratna as our moderator this evening. Um, now Ratna also co-leads a research module on informing governance responses on in a changing ocean. And this is part of another multi-million dollar research initiative at OFI, Ocean Frontier Institute, based here at uh, Dalhousie. And they've just completed one of their conferences, which uh, hopefully was productive. Uh, looking, I'm seeing a few nodding, nodding heads with heads, so that's, uh, that's, that's tremendous. So without further ado, may I please introduce uh, Dr. Ratna Chirpaiti. You're all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. It's always great to be back in Halifax, and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this very uh, important and exciting event. Uh, I've been uh, working with Mike and Madeline and uh, others to host this lecture uh, series. So we haven't been able to do this for the past few years, so this is uh, a real treat to be able to get back together with this. So I really appreciate that. Uh, um, you know, all the work of uh, AOI and congratulations on the anniversary as well. So, when we thought about who would make a really good uh, you know, lecture coming back together, this year is, is, is very big for many reasons. Mike already mentioned the International Year of Seasonal Fisheries and Aquaculture. We know that we are in the ocean decade, right? The European Commission decade of ocean science. Our keynote speaker for tonight actually has been working on major, he's leading another one of those partnership grants on Ocean Canada, uh, called Ocean Canada Partnership. 
that's not in the Bible, but that's something that I, I think we need to acknowledge. So for the first time, just like what we were doing with the small scale fisheries globally, but she is leading this major initiative to look at Canada's ocean, but also globally, because that's what she does. He works, you know, he's really well known internationally. So if, if you don't see Rashid in Canada, basically Rashid would pop up in places that are really engaging with scientists and researchers to talk about really important issues about the ocean and about fisheries. So we were just talking about how many years ago now we have known each other. So it is really good number, right? You can assume we're celebrating our, our 30 years of knowing each other. So you can imagine that I have followed Rafi's career and admired what he has done for all these years and look up to him as someone who is really, who is really can make an impact and a difference in a way that you know we would all want to do. But not everybody would be able to do what Rashid has been able to do. So that's something that I learned from Rashid. And I really think that um, the talk that we, he's going to be delivering tonight would again be something that really set us to think about what all of us can do in order to help contribute to the ocean sustainability. So we also would have three discussions, and you would, I would talk about them later on. And again, I don't, I don't want to read Rashid's bio because you have it in front of you. So all I want to say about Rashid is that I mean, like I said, I think, uh, I think uh, it's important that we uh, we get um, we're going to be getting a real uh, real insight into what Rashid has been doing, and uh, we wanted to thank Rashid for coming and joining us tonight. So go ahead, please, Rashid. Mike is here and all the committee members who, who thought it would be good to, for me to come and share some things with you. Thanks a lot. And I know that your time is very precious, right? Everybody here, there are tons of things you could do in this hour you chose to be here. So, for an economist, you know what they ask me? <laughs> this is the most valuable time you could have done with your time today, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, now you can contest me, but that's what the data shows. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much. That's the title of my talk, and uh, Canada's Ocean, Canada's Oceans and Coast, and uh, Pathways to Sustainability in the Sea of Change. This is actually the title of our forthcoming book. Is David here? Not this one. It's not. Yeah, actually, he, he, the title came from him. It's part of our Ocean Canada Partnership. It's very good at picking titles. It's amazing, right? So, so that's where this comes from. But my talk, I will start. Actually, this is Pathways to Sustainability is for the whole world. And I think uh, Elizabeth will be really happy to hear this topic, which she was here. She was already in the high seas and deep seas talking about humanity and everybody, right? So she was thinking global, she was thinking big. And I didn't know the part of what she was struggling to get the world to think about way back in this talk. And as you will all agree with me, just dealing with sustainability alone is not easy, right? You think about fisheries, it's so hard to manage them sustainably. Uh, it's difficult to understand the environment, all the changes. And stakeholders, everybody has something they are interested in. Change. So even when I see of change, this is not an easy thing, right? And then we have all these changes happening. Oh my God, climate change, ocean 
classification deal. So this is not easy, really. It's, it's a difficult thing to do. So let's see what I managed to do with that. So that's what I'm saying. It's challenging, but I always say, as many of us think this way, whatever there are big challenges, there are also opportunities, right? There are big opportunities. Because think about it. Anyone who is able to solve our energy problem with a polluting environment, can you imagine what opportunity that would be, right? Uh, this is how uh, Elon Musk became the richest person with his electric cars. And there you go. So challenges and opportunities go together. So the way I structure this is I'll start by talking in general about actually my research approach or research principle in terms of dealing with this in general, right? As an economist, as a researcher, how I approach uh, research to support ocean sustainability. Then I give you a few examples of our work. I have uh, three, three key uh, papers or uh, results to show with you. And then there will be a closer remark, remark where I really lift off and take us to the whole world, you know? Because like I like to say, even Canadian oceans are no islands, you know? We had that before, we are connected all over, so I will end up that way. That's the layout for, for you. So let's get going. General principles approach. I think if you want to really start dealing with our ocean issues, our fisheries issues, you have to go big. You have to go big, right? So we have many of us studying fish, how they move one fish, this is all important. But the kind of big global challenge, the sea change we are seeing, means that some of us at least have to take up the big issues connected to the ocean. What I'm talking about overfishing here, huh? Fishing down the marine food web that our colleague Dan Pauli made, made famous, right? Uh, what are you talking about oil spills, marine debris, climate change will come in. These are huge things that are impacting the whole ocean, and we have to really uh, take these big challenges. So that's point number one. Second point, we really have to recognize how tightly we the people, human beings, all that we do is connected to the ocean. Even if you're ill now, even if you don't have a coast, you are connected to the ocean. I could list a number of things that you know, oxygen, lots of integrated by the ocean, life in the ocean, all the allergies and so on. Uh, absorption of heat. Uh, I like to say that I'd love to be in Vancouver in winter than be in Winnipeg, for example. Why so? The Pacific Ocean helps to modify uh, our winter so we can, you know, go out uh, completely being frozen. The Winnipeg people would not like this, but, but that is it. So, so the ocean does a lot of things. This picture, this is my favorite model of the relationship, the interaction between people and nature, all right? If you think of it, you go to the basics. What do people do when we go to the ocean? Or to nature in general, actually, you can expand this. We do two things. One, we take all the things we like, the things we need, the things we desire, we take from the ocean, like the fish. There are many things I could answer. You take it take it into our economy, our culture, our social stuff. We do all that we do with that. And what do we produce at the end? Waste. So you have the CO2, you have uh, ghost fishing, people living uh, debris in the ocean. All those things come out of our economic activity. So in the name, what we do, the good things come from the ocean, and the bad things go to the ocean, or to the environment at large. So for me as a researcher, this realization is really very fundamental. That means our research has to be interdisciplinary because we have to understand the fish, the habitat, the chemistry, the physics of the ocean. And you have to have all the social sciences. You have to have anthropology, sociology, human science, cultural, you know, law, where is, where is the, uh, Elizabeth, right? All the legal people and our project Ocean Canada, your project, we go into this line. We bring people from all, not only academics, but also non-academics. Because really, partnership is important. 
you've got to co-create the solutions for them to work in many instances. And when you take the good stuff, how you use them, how you distribute them, right? is the big guys taking everything and leaving the small postal people who really depend on this resource for their livelihood, or the big boys that can jump from Namibia to California to, to Peru, change their capital into something and buy things in the stock market, who should get the access to it? So these are all part of it. So this is really a big interdisciplinary partnership co-creation exercise. And these guys, my research a lot. So I'm an economist. I actually call myself an interdisciplinary ocean and fisheries economist. Because really, I don't, I don't think even economists can solve the ocean problem. I tell them, they said, they shot. Oh, we could do it. No, you can't. Nobody can. We have to work together, right? So that is the, 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 the next one is. You really have to focus on working at the intersections of disciplines. This connects to the last picture, right? And so you have to embrace diversity in ideas, approaches, and perspectives. Right? So if you are a typical economist who says all that matters is profit, then you cannot fit into this picture. No, somebody is going to tell you, look here, we don't care about profit. No, to some extent, we don't care about profit. We care about health. We care about or lack of fascinations, right? Indigenous people. So you have to be broad in your thinking. You can't just be in a, in a little uh, box, no. You have to show genuine understanding of what approaches and methods of disciplines other than yours, right? For me, economics, right? And, and this is, was our guiding, guiding principle. When we started Ocean Canada, we had to do extra workshops for us to understand each other. We had a philosophy professor, down to the most intense ecologist, right? And one day we thought, what are you talking, right? So we have, have to spend time to learn to listen to each other. That is important. You have to be aware that there are multiple ways of approaching a problem, obviously. And you have to promote divergent thinking. And this is one of the things. When I'm in class, I'm always looking for that. There was one law student in my class, and I only one economist would say, oh, the problem is common property, open access. Privatize the ocean and everything will be fine. <laughs> and the student said, Rashid, are you sure? <laughs> said, that is the received theory. He said, come on. For me, as a lawyer, what matters is the law, he said. Right? And he gave an example, he said, just think about it. If, if you own a house and something is spoiled, there, there is a damage in the house, because it is your house, you can actually ignore that. I mean, sometimes you decide what to do. But if you're renting and you do that, somebody is going to knock on your door, right? And then I, he made me to reflect back to our home, and he's right. There are things I should have fixed, right? But I, I keep, and we ended up doing a paper, so, so bringing this in there. So that's the kind of thing we need to be able to deal with sustainability when things are changing like they are now. And you have to co-produce co knowledge. I've talked about that in partnership. This is our Ocean Canada team, one of our meetings. You know, we were so crazy, we had a movie-making professor. Why is that? Yeah, that's Ian here, University of Winnipeg. And his team, they were not only disseminating our research, they were also documenting the process. So when we are meeting there, they are noting down, filming, and taking notes. So, so that's it. You really have to take work together seriously in order to, to deal with this. Nancy Dorundi from uh, not Water Master. She's in the philosophy department. Right? <coughs> so she'll ask us a question, and we'll just sit up and think again, right? So that's the kind of thing you need. And it, does, it should be policy relevant. You really have to not just theoretical stuff for the final thing. You should choose things that really mean something in terms of policy. And because I, my group, and the teams we have formed do this, it's taking us to places. It's just crazy sometimes. In terms of standing and talking, so how did I get here? Right? And, you know, I can ask at the WTO, then the WTO the boss, Pascal Lamy, we did a report our first global. Database of fisheries subsidies, he got a copy, he read, 
have comments page to this. You invited us, we had a meeting. And we had questions. No, that's because the thing was running. And we started doing this when the world gave the WTO the mandate to try to discipline the so-called harmful subsidies. That is subsidies that encourage overfishing, overcapitalization, take the fish down, and harm the fishes. Next stage, right? So, so this is what I tell you. If you love fishes, some would like to say fishermen, fishes, then you better love the fish first. If you don't have fish, there'll be no fishes, right? This simple thing is so difficult for people. We just want one more fish, more fish from where? So, so, so that is the, the one. This one is in the US uh, Senate, actually. We did a paper where we calculated how much more potential benefit that the US could get from their fish stocks that are currently overfishing the press. So we did the, the, the calculations, they asked, come and tell us about it. So for our numbers, Ended up in the, in the US budget that year. That's, that's how crazy this is. And, and that one, that's at the United Nations uh, giving a talk. And this gentleman, <laughs> the day I got, my letter came, Buckingham uh, Palace on it. So our secretary, Janice, uh, you know Janice, right? Uh, Megan. So she wouldn't put that letter in the mailbox. She came and said, Rashid, I'm not putting this letter because of the stamp on it. Yeah. And let's talk about the oceans. And for here, one of the things he said, Rashid, tell me which nations are, are causing the biggest mess on our oceans, and I'll invite them here for dinner. Uh -huh. So that's, that's how crazy it is. It's a, and I could give you more and more stories about this. So policy relevant, political research. That is one of the examples I'll give uh, as we go. And you have to mobilize the knowledge. I really am not impressed about publishing my papers and leaving them in the journals. I'm not, I want it out to the public, to policy makers, to people who can make me something, to NGOs. Um, Bob is here at Oceana. Get the information out so people can use it if they want, then at least make it. So we make a big of <coughs> Actually, we call it, um, how do we call it, getting the information to Canadians. So we are all on website is great, people tell me. I'm on Twitter, I probably tweeted you guys today. I, said, uh, I think my last one on this is, yes, you can join this even if you are not in Halifax. Here's the link, right? So who knows how many are out there. We do videos, we do all sorts of things. It's and, uh, no one actually in 2021 our project won the Czech Impact Award uh, because of all these things we have been able to do and continue to. So mobilize your knowledge. Please don't keep your information in journals and be happy. No, take it up. So that's just to kind of the framing of the way I think researchers need to work in order to be able to support sustainability in the sea of change, right? So I'll give you a few examples here now of some of the things we, we did. This is a very big favorite of mine, and it was done very early by somebody you know. This paper, uh, Megan, you know, <laughs> it was quite a paper actually, you know. Megan was a postdoc, she's in our team. So she, she I think you called me, right? And said, Rashid, elections are coming in Canada. How about we do an op-ed? Write about all that is happening. This is the half a year. So you know what that is with all scientists being muscled and all that. And so let's write uh, an op-ed and say, look here, whoever wins the election, this are ocean issues you should not ignore. And then I smiled and said, okay, you know what? Before we can say that, I think we should do a paper. <laughs> we can just go and just talk. I said, okay, let's do a paper. So she led the effort, and we had 19 of other colleagues, and we wrote this piece, uh, which, as I said, I, I really like it a lot. It was topical, it was in time, just in time. We got it published around election time, and the press went crazy about this, we were all over. In fact, CIBC, uh, no, CBC, after this interview, see, within 
Within a few hours, we got over 8,200 shares. So see, this is, a, this is the biggest we've seen so far. This is crazy, right? In this kind of way. So um, when the first Trudeau government came, I think within a few months, three of them went down. The uh, muscling was easy. Stop it, scientists can't talk, for example. That was one of our. It was the Fisheries Act which took time, but that too, I think, has gone through. So actually, all we ask for, we got. That is topical policy relevant just in time research. I love it. Thank you, and well done, Paul, for the work that I made. That was beautiful. All right, climate change. I couldn't finish this without talking about climate change. That's a big change. So actually our project was structured such so that we say our aim is to try to do research that will help Canadians, coastal Canadians in particular, indigenous people, to be able to deal with the climate changes. So that's the big overarching goal. So we couldn't get away from climate change. No. It's getting warmer. Let's see ice, more acidic, less oxygen, you name it, multiple stresses on the same animals, right? So, and, and the thing about this is, is the hotspots for each of them is actually a bit different. And that is an additional scary thing, right? Think of it, most of the fish are moving away from the equator towards the poles. They are running from boiling water, let's say, right? So here is fish trying to get away from too hot water. They have their range, right? Uh, every animal has that range, comfortable temperature. If it's too high or too low, we the people, what do we do? You open your window, let it to cool you down. Air conditioned heater. The fish don't have that. So if it's getting too hot, if they can move, they move. Most of them perish because they can't move fast enough. So that's one process. The fish are following stocks on the move. And then one of the hotspots or ocean acidification in the Arctic. So here you are, and, and, and Kumiko, we are here about ocean acidification, right? So you have fish running away from boiling water into acidic water. Think about that. So that's how I framed it in my head to really get me wet up, right? So, so we have issues. And the Pacific, North Pacific, is also a hotspot of deoxygenation. That is areas in the ocean where the minimum oxygen required, the best uh, proper technology, the ONZ, is actually dropping. And the North Pacific is one of those hotspots again. So, so you have all this happening. Real changes to our uh, ocean. And, and this is an early paper we did actually, which uh, where we said, I, I passed what did the disciplinary work last year. So I hear my ecologists, scientists talking about all these changes, people like uh, William Chan and so on and others. And I said, oh my God, if this is happening, if the biophysics of the ocean is changing, then something is going to happen to the animals in the ocean. It's a simple economic thing. And if we depend on the animals, as I know we do, the fish, then our fisheries will also be impacted. Very simple logic. So that's it. If all of this are happening, then of course you're going to affect the organism, the population, the community, and also ultimately the fishes. So there is that. And that has been the trend of research that many people do, the impact of climate change on fishes. Recently, there is a new move to look in the other direction. What this taking I talked about and the pumping of waste, say from this sector, the other economic sector, what does this do to the animals and therefore to climate change? As we learn more and more, animals do sequester carbon in the ocean. In fact, in an earlier work with me and Alex Rogers at Oxford University, we did a piece where we looked at the economic benefit of the, uh, the animals in the high seas taking carbon down and hiding it away for hundreds of years versus catching the fish in the high sea and selling it in the valley. And it was 10 to 1, 10 to 1. The carbon value, sequestration value is 10 times the value of catching the fish and eating. So, 
and, and, and when the fish is gone, when you deplete the fish, you lose this, right? That's one example. So what you do in your fisheries also does affect climate change. So there is a timeline. Stopping overfishing is also climate action, right? Uh, doing a whole lot of the frontiers of that with 10 to 12 papers, which will come up soon. So what do you do with climate change? So in our project, we have lots of papers on climate change, but I thought I would show one where we did a special issue of, uh, what is it, uh, society, Ecology of Society, and this is some interdisciplinary piece, piece. We had our uh, Dalhousie collaborators. You realize that we do collaborate a lot with, with your team here. So you be seeing the house. So which one? I have a quiz for you. Which is the real ocean university? Is it you guys in the house? <laughs> OK, no, I don't want to hear the answer. Yeah. But we, we, we really, it's the two big universities when it comes to the ocean. So we collaborate a lot. So what we did in that paper, we had four papers, two led by UBC and two led by David and Phil and their students. Phil Saunders and David. David. And then William Chan and myself and our students, we did two, coming from the ecology and economics and they from law and policy. So that volume will give you an interdisciplinary picture. And, and that's what I'm going to show the work of our PhD student then. That's uh, Juliano. And the, the question we ask is you know, Canada and the US share a number of stocks and have a number of agreements actually to jointly manage these stocks. If you're on the West Coast, you're thinking of Halifax, you're thinking of salmon, all the agreements with the US. The US. And on this coast, we look mainly at the, uh, we, we looked at the, uh, yeah. So we look at the Gulf of Maine agreement again, where there are a number of stuff that are shared. And the question we ask is, what does it mean in terms of ecology, economics, and the law, and policy? And we probably just wrote four papers in that one. And uh, so this is where the, the, uh, uh, Mr. Palacio Apprentice, yeah, his finish is not a postdoc, actually. He's a very good student. So he built models and, and tried to analyze what will happen. And I took that in the second paper and did quite a bit of game theory, which I'm not going to go into. Because the thing about these agreements is that one of the big issues with them is their stability, how stable are they? And when you have change coming, if fish are moving, it destabilizes the agreements. Because these agreements are usually designed based on what we call the threat points all of the parties involved. So if Halibut spends more time in Canada in their lives, say three quarters of the time and one quarter in the US, that has to be built into the agreement for it to be stable, right? Because in game theory and in economics, Canada will sign on to this only if they will get more than what they will get if they they went alone, they didn't cooperate. So that's what we call threat. And that has to be in there. By, by fish moving, this becomes destabilized. So instead of the quarter and three quarters, suddenly it's 50 50. Then the US will say, oh no, this is not fair. We could catch more when they are in our place half of the time. So, so the whole thing arrives. And this has happened with some of actually. Country. So, so that's the kind of thing we analyze here. There is a model developed. It's just uh, part of the model. I'm just quickly going to show you that. And, and this is uh, so you have different kinds depicting the different species where they are. And we looked at a good climate scenario and a terrible one. Say the Paris Agreement, if we were to meet it, that's uh, I think that's 2.6, RCP 2.6. And then if we fail, which we are failing at the moment, then we go to 8.5 and we did the modeling and uh, I have a few slides just uh, the key thing is to draw the idea so those interested can check the paper uh, it's published and, and the other papers in, in the series so, so here you are we did some detailed modeling work here and then yep, some of the results uh, I'm going to show you a few slides yeah. so this is one of the pictures we produced from this one 
and the colors tell you where fish will increase and where fish biomass will increase. Because the second it takes, some aliens will actually get. And this is the mild scenario, and this is the heavy climate scenario. You can see, for example, here you have more rain uh, around Canada. Look at this. So all this will be losing fish, actually. And the fish will be going to Alaska. That's what the prediction is saying. And we are beginning to see that. And, and, and uh, William and his student actually did a study where they looked at they went back 100 years and look at the menus. I love this kind of science. It's, uh, it's just beautiful. So they looked at menus of restaurants, seafood restaurants, or restaurants that sell fish in Vancouver for 100 years to see what kind of fish they were selling. And they tracked it. And it's really showing we're seeing more and more fish on the menus, right, than before, uh, that were not here at all. When I moved to Canada, tilapia was hardly seen in any supermarket. And today you know the story, right? So, so there, there are those changes. And this complicates management big time, right? So is it that the people here, the people here can just move there and fish? It's not usually easy. Fish don't need passport, right? Fish can move, they don't need visa. The people do, right? <laughs> Sometimes I want to be fish, but we just go. So, so that is the kind of thing we find, and I believe this is a bit too small for you to read. I apologize for that. But essentially, what we are seeing is that if you look at the movement and the trend points I mentioned, the Halibut agreement is quite stable, it seems. So, the temperature will not shift the biomass to the extent that the agreement can collapse. But in the case of the Gulf of, this Gulf of Maine, actually, it looks like it is very unstable because it's more pronounced movement, and therefore the, 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 the agreements can be shaped. And in many of the situations where we go, Canada will actually gain uh, because uh, they're moving from the south up north, right? at least for some time, for a moment. At least, yeah. So that's, that's uh, the second result I wanted to show you. And now we go to this is where we come to. Elizabeth work actually. This is the high seas. You know, spending a lot of time on the high seas. You know, the high seas is anything beyond 200 nautical miles of the coastal country. So, what is, so we call them country waters. And as part of the global ocean, that we put this demarcation. Governments, many of them, do their best to manage their waters. But most people, the high seas is really, uh, I call it the weakest link. And so we'll be looking at all, and these are all sorts of reasons why, why, why we're worried about the high sea. Remember, the ocean is all connected, right? So if one part is badly managed, it's going to affect the parts that you are trying to manage. So we have to think holistically, and I'll come back to, to this point later. But there are various reasons. For example, inequity. About eight to ten countries take most of the benefits from our calculation. We're talking about the big countries, we're talking about China, we're talking about Taiwan, Korea, Spain, right? They take all the benefits. So we have a proposal, which I will tell you, some of you may have heard this already. How do we deal with this? And there is a lot of crazy stuff. The modern slave labor, huh? And without subsidies, our, our, our estimation is that 54% of the fishing grounds in the high seas will not be viable economically. So if we take our subsidies, the WTO, they are meeting now. Today is Fish Week at the WTO. And mid-June, they are going to meet, hopefully get an agreement to redirect discipline harmful subsidies. And if they did that, for the highest, that would protect about 50% already of the fishing grounds. Because if these guys are fishing for profit, then they, they will be profitable. Right? So that is the kind of thing. So the, 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 the highest is are the weakest link, and so we have suggestions here through our work, and this is one of the early papers we did in Ocean Canada, where we look at what would it mean to close the high seas to fish and complete uh -huh. this controversial. But the more you think about this, the more you like it, actually. I right? Because you know what? The high seas is two-thirds of the ocean. 
there is large. Productivity is not high there. Most of the productivity is on the continental shelf. That's why the UN agreed to just say 200 not miles as country waters. Because there's not much happening there. All right? So this large area, we take about 5, 8%, some estimate 10% of our total global catch pool. Comes from these two tests of the area. And this is what made me to start thinking about processing. I said, come on, just purely on economics. You have to run around these two tests of the whole ocean to catch 5%. How sensible is that? Then you're pumping CO2. And you're doing this because of subsidies. So how about if you close it? Whole place, what would we lose, right? It turns out that the animals living in the high seas all their lifetime are very few, less than 1% of the total. Because and they are very special, they are slow growing because the place is dark, it beat or some line of food. So they are very special and you don't want to touch them. And so so that is uh, that is uh, so we came up with that suggestion. It will help the biology, it will help the economists. And it will also help socially because small countries. Canada will actually make more kite because Canada is not big on the ice, it's almost nothing green. So, but then we have such a big border, the in and out. So remember, the ice is what they catch are mainly highly migratory fish stocks, the tunas essentially. And they do go in and out. You can kite them when they come in cheaply with less carbon pumping. And smaller countries and poorer countries, small scale people can also get this. And that was what it used to be historically. All right. So, so now to my to my few big points. So I like to say that Canada's oceans are more islands, and this is what I do with a lot these days because the world is connected, and some of us tend to forget this. I wish it away, but the world is the world, right? The oceans out on you put North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and ice, the fish don't know this, right? So, like I say, fish and microplastic, they don't know. They don't respect human made boundaries, right? And, and this is one of the reasons I love working with the ocean, because it connects all of us in a way. So, what I really want to provoke, I say we actually have one humanity. One humanity. And until the day that a majority of the world's population knows that the way we can all do well is for the world population all to do well, then we're still in trouble. And I have hope that the world will get there. I don't know why, don't ask me for a date. <laughs> but I think young people, for example, are already showing this, right? They will get to a point say, this craziness, Ukraine and Russia fighting. Stupidity, right? And so they say we have to work together and, and make the world better. And when that day comes, then we'll start really because and our markets are all interconnected, right? You cut fish in South Africa, the media within 10 hours it is it is important, right? So the connections are there. Then our governance systems are not connected. We are all doing our thing, probably this or this. There are good reasons for that. And that means we have to think and act both locally and globally. You know, you know the whole saying, think, think uh, globally and act locally. That will not do, we have to act globally too. And I know there's a group where is uh, my dear friend here. Yeah, well, that, that, where are you? I'm over here. Yeah, 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 all this, uh, your group, for example, trying to connect to, to West Africa. So the Nova Scotia West Africa connection, and there's a long history connection here, right? Not just the African Nova Scotia, but everybody could be connected in some way because we are connected. And that would be a good thing, I think, for the province, for Canada, and of course for the Africans, you know. So that's one thing I, I, I like to leave you with. The second thing is, you guys are two books today. <laughs> this is my book. October last, last year, published Infinity Fish, and I came with a real copy, right? So you know that this is real. It's a title that, that really blows me. They love They love it. Uh, sure, I, well, I have a few minutes, right, to tell the story of the title because it's quite cool, actually. Right? So years ago, I got invited to Namibia to give a talk. It's National Fisheries Day. 
If you know Namibia, you know there are two resources that are really important. One is fish, the other is diamond. Both of them are about 10% of the GDP, so this is serious part. I used to go there every year, I'll go a number of times, and I say, in Namibia, if you land there, if you're a foreigner, you take the national newspaper. Day one, day two, and you don't see the fisheries minister on the first day, then he or she is out of the country. That's how important fish is. <laughs> so they asked me to come and give a talk. And I landed. I didn't know the local politics going on there. They, they always fighting each other because the fish, the mining takes place off offshore of that one. So they and the fishing boats are always complaining. So I landed and I told them, one of the things I told them, back through with ministers in there, I said, you know, one of my messages is that fish is more valuable than that. And it was like I threw something in the room. Like, what? In the midst of fishers or shop itself, right? And I explained this in two ways. One, I said, fish is really one. No argument about that. If you manage it wisely, you can continue to go back to the fish. Get the fish, take care of your needs forever. You can do it to infinity, right? And anything that gives you benefit, even if it is small, yearly, year upon year, if you sum this to infinity mathematically, it's infinity. So infinity fish. That's where it came, infinity fish. So that's one reason. On the other hand, that one is not forever, even though popular harvesters is gone. You dig a ton of that one today, it's gone forever, right? You can go back and dig the same that one. And with the ministers there say, so, you know, I know what is going in your minds. So you're thinking, oh, we will take the one ton, invest the money, and that will give us benefit for our I, I said, I know you guys are all running deficits. You never save money, right? You think you're going to go the fish will be there. So, so that's it. The second point I gave was that I really believe that fish is, valuable. It's a valuable thing for many people. That one is a valuable thing for a few people. And if you have a room like this, you say, how many of you have seen that in your lifetime? Very few people raise their hand. How many of you have eaten fish in the last weekend? Oh, right. So, so that, to me, is it more value because it's democratic, it's there for small and large scale, for rich and poor. If you have a good day, you know, in Halifax, you are rich, you go to a seafood restaurant or you go to another seafood. If you're in West Africa or Southeast Asia, fish may be the only animal protein you get to eat, right? Good for the poor and good for the rich. So that is, a, that is how the title of this book comes. So, so the origin of this idea actually is from the old continent. I like to say, not only me, many people say Africa is, the, what, what do they call it? Africa is a mother of all continents. Have you heard that before? Yeah, Africa is mother. You are all Africans in this country. <laughs> I did this to Americans. And I was a Rhode Island. I said, you know what? You are all Africans in the world. <laughs> yeah, so, so it started from that place. We have to connect, right? Yeah. Um, it's fun, isn't it? So, so now, this slide is something that came because of COVID. That's another sea change. Have these biological vases that we cannot see, shutting down the world, hiding all of us in our rooms. Could you imagine? It's remarkable. And that made me start thinking. So, these days, I'm always looking for solutions. I say, I'm looking for stones that could save two beds. You know? say two, saving two beds with one stone, you know? You know, the real saying is, you kill them with one stone, you don't kill them. I said this and someone said, how do you do that? I said, you know, you take the stone and chase the people who want to kill them. <laughs> so, so this is the kind of solutions I'm talking I'm looking for. And COVID caused me to think, and, and we are doing a paper now, actually. It's in progress, and the whole idea is, we have environmental problems, we have CO2. If only our societies can do it, the economist is there to back you. We have this saying, uh, we say, what do you say? Let the polluter pay. And now it's becoming more and more difficult to tax people for anything. You know, 
So you let the polluter pay, that helps to reduce the pollution because it's economics. Then you get that revenue and you take it to provide basic income for people who are struggling, right? Who will go for the last fish because they have to feed themselves, lift people out of poverty to a level that they are not under that pressure. So you improve the environment and you improve the lives of people in the world. So if every human being can get an above poverty line income, I think we will be solving a lot of our problems. Think of what are we doing COVID. It hits us, we don't have a resilient system, many people lost their income and then and if not, so governments panic because we don't want to starve any citizen. So they pump out all this money. You remember that, right? Two thousand dollars. They were so panicked that you don't they didn't know to do anything. Just take the money. We can talk about it later, right? <laughs> if we had a basic income, that there will be no need for it. You know, so if you lose your job, you have the, the, to keep alive at least. And then this panic and the pumping of money, now we're all facing inflation and everybody in shock. I knew inflation was going to go up. <laughs> well, I didn't mean, you know we're not producing much, we have money to but where is it? So <coughs> it's gonna show up, right? So these kind of things will make us resilient as we face these big changes. Alright? So that work is on progress. This is the <coughs> final slide. So this idea is, uh, is to say look, you have people, you have nature. And the only reason nature has problems is because we, the people, go there, right? People tell me, oh, you know, these things are eating all our salmon. Or oh, big fish are eating all the small fish. They say, come on. I mean, these this animals know how to balance this. They're smart enough to know that they don't eat all their young ones, right? So there would be a natural balance in there. You know, like seals would know how to be with salmon and so on. It is one way go. So this model, simple model, is saying that we should design our policies and take actions in ways that positive feedback. We, we create positive feedback from people to nature and nature to people, not negative feedback like we're doing now. For example, subsidies. 80% of subsidies we give around the world, $35 billion, 80% goes to large scale. Industrial fishing ponds, not the small scale ones. The coastal people, this is their thing, this is their livelihoods. They cannot jump off and go to Australia and catch the next fish. They don't get this money. So, this aggravates, it aggravates inequality, sabotaging the sustainable development of the WTO, uh, of the world, world of the United Nations. And it also does social things, it aggravates gender inequality. Because the women who fish, fish with small boats. So you give it to the big guys again. It disadvantages the youth. The youth don't start with big boats. It disadvantages them. It disadvantages developing countries. And if they are in, in if they don't have balance, we are going to see. There's no question about it. You can build walls. They will go through the walls. People are people. You don't sit down and die, do you? This is the history of immigration. It takes that time. The fish are moving, by the way. And people have to stay and die where they are. No, they will do all they can. So it is in our interest to make sure this, we do, our policies don't aggravate these problems. You know, how about future, future generations? One time I was thinking, if you ask fish, imagine that they can talk. I'm going to be a whisper to the fish now. So uh, you ask fish, you, you know what people are doing? They're giving their taxpayer money. One the developing country, they need hospitals, schools, they give taxpayer money to fish to go undermine the fish that the coastal people. You are the fish, what do you think about people? I think fish will say people are dumb. People are just silly. We are willing to give ourselves to feed them and this is what they do, right? You don't do that. No, you don't. So you have to look for ways to help me. And an example with subsidies is this idea. If a fish fishing area is depressed because of overfishing, you pay the fishers to go fish for plastic rather than fish. See? Plastic is already in there. So they like to be on the water. They help us clean. They get their livelihood. They make the ocean cleaner. They give the fish a break so we can have more fish in the future. 
these are the kind of beautiful ideas that we have to create so that we can save two or more minutes with one story. Thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, And so while we're up here, um, you know, and separated and differentiated as academics and geo, government, industry, um, I actually think we have more in common than not. And one component of that commonality, I think, is a desire to contribute to conservation. Um, there's an interesting comment made by one of my students uh, last week, and it's, it's her story to tell, so I won't tell the whole story, but it just was a bit of language. Um, and that to some people, conservation might mean conserving fish. Um, to other people, conservation might mean conserving industry or a way of life. Um, and so for me, when I think about conservation, it's conserving an ocean full of fish, but not um, as protected entities necessarily, um, but because I think that the, the human-fish relationship is something that we, uh, we don't want to let go. Um, and so while at UBC we, we often heard um, that managing fish is managing people, but you heard it at Dalhousie, the best ocean university in Canada, that I, I would actually say that managing fish is about managing relationships, people's relationships with fish and people's relationships with the ocean. So it's this conservation that I want to focus on in my remarks tonight, uh, conserving the relationship between fish, fisheries, and food. 
And I will apologize in advance that I do have a fairly fisheries uh, focus, and I recognize Canada's oceans and coasts are more than that. Um, I often start out asking students in my fisheries management class, why do we have fisheries management? Right? And people often think it's to conserve fish. And I say, if that's what we wanted, we just wouldn't fish. Like if our objective was just to conserve fish populations, we wouldn't fish, right? So we fish for something else because it brings us benefits. Um, and that management should be done to ensure that those benefits flow in a good way. But it's not just fisheries management um, that determines how those benefits arise and how they're distributed. So it's also determined by provincial trade policies, federal food policies, investment in treaty education, social welfare policies, et cetera. Um, I want to jump for a second to the sea of change aspect of the panel. Um, so the Ocean Frontier Institute's 2022 conference concluded midday today, and climate change was, was all over the place, as rightly it should be. Climate change touches everyone and everything. But I do think um, we focus on that kind of change as something that's happening to us. And instead I want for a minute to think about the change we bring about. Um, so the pathways to sustainability are realized through us as change makers, not necessarily through us digging and slogging a pathway through change and a mess that's happening to us, right? Um, so climate change notwithstanding, what changes are happening that we want to see, right, that help us to see these pathways, to form and follow these pathways to sustainability? For me professionally and personally, there are kind of four areas, three of which are happening and one is not happening that I think should. Uh, so I'll just briefly touch on those four, four things. So the first is attention to Indigenous rights. The second is data uh, accessibility and analytics. The third is implementation of ecosystem-based management. And then the fourth is what's not happening, which is this idea of fish as food. And I'll just touch on these really briefly as, as pathways. Um, so together, these changing areas offer a wealth of pathways for sustainability. Attention to Indigenous rights. Um, Rashid mentioned the book, uh, the Ocean Canada Partnership book that's coming out. Um, Russ Jones from the Haida Nation led two chapters in that book. And one of those chapters looks at the articles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRA, and discusses how those articles could be brought to bear um, to, to deal with reconciliation in this country. So I'll give an example, uh, implementing under Articles 19 and 26 together, those speak to the allocation policies and plans and targets that account for Indigenous title and rights to specific territories. And that by implementing those under Articles, we can start to reconcile issues of the loss of territory and the loss of benefits derived from territory. So this is a change that is happening um, recently, right? And it's a great change, is this attention to Indigenous rights. Um, I do want to touch on a, a definition of reconciliation. This is by Rohana uh, in a publication from 2011. So a process that seeks a genuine, just, and enduring end to the conflict between the parties and transformation of the nature of the relationship between the societies through a course of action involving intertwined political and social changes, which addresses politically tangible issues such as distribution of power and historical responsibility. So I raise that because DFO has a reconciliation strategy and it emphasizes the need to implement under. But fundamentally, it's not clear how that reconciliation strategy can deal with historical power imbalances, right? So that's not just a DFO thing. And it's something that needs a reckoning in this country and shared governance authority when it comes to oceans and coasts. So this change is happening. I think it's a great change and it definitely offers us a pathway to sustainability. Um, but in line with UNDRIP, we also need more treaty education. And that's a change in this province. My son, my oldest son's here today, he's in grade two, um, and you know, learns about Mi'kmaq culture in school. And I hope one day he'll learn about the treaties that we all have to be accountable to. Um, a lot of conflict that the commercial industry brings to the waters being fished by Mi'kmaq, I think is because of a lack of treaty education. So although my seven-year-old gets that education, we as adults haven't had that, and I think that's really important. Um, I'll touch really briefly on data accessibility and analytics. Um, so leaving the OFI conference this week, there's a lot of shiny data products. Um, and we know that that's important, right? We're in the UN Decade of Ocean Science. Um, but I want to bring up a funny story that Daniel Pauly told me, um, which was he made this kind of silly graph because we had this concept like more information leads to better management, right? And so Daniel shows this funny graph about fish base. If you're not familiar with fish base, it's kind of this online portal, it's community built, so you can put in data uh, like history characteristics of different fish species, and then people use those data to populate their models, um, etc. So it's a really neat database. But Rashid showed this, or Daniel showed this uh, graph between the number of entries in fish base and the relationship between stock status. 
population status, right? So the question is, is there any relationship to the entries in fish base and how well our stocks are managed? No relationship, right? So more information doesn't lead to better management, okay? And so I just, I, this idea that we just need more data to manage things better, I think the way this, this kind of transformation of data is exciting, um, but we also need to have kind of an ethical um, element to this and understanding who has, you know, who owns data and how those data are used in control of who and governance of who. So those are kind of changes that are happening that I think we do need to also just be a little cognizant of. Um, thirdly, implementation of more holistic management, such as ecosystem-based management, is a pathway to sustainability. I'm not going to touch too much on that because um, Nancy's up here with DFO, but I've been lucky enough to work with Alida uh, and members of her team on uh, DFO's development of an ecosystem-based management framework, which is a really um, a nice change. It's a it's a slow change, not not just here, but the idea of ecosystem-based management is over two decades old. Um, but institutionalization of those ideas in PFO is really exciting. So thanks to Alan and her team for all of that work. And then finally, fish as food. So this is the one that doesn't really seem to be happening too much. Um, but a few years ago, I was on a panel here at Dalhousie, hosted by the McKechnie Institute. And I spoke about what fish policy is really food policy, and there are lots of examples. Um, and here's a change that's, again, not happened fast enough. So while DFO works on managing fisheries, they do not manage what we do with those fish. How are the benefits from fisheries as food production shared, right? Um, we hear calls from scholars, NGOs, and communities to include fish as part of sustainable food systems, but that doesn't seem to be happening in practice. Um, so I'll give a couple of examples. Governments work to increase our export of local seafood, and while they're doing that, communities across the country are food insecure. Why do we not think about local fish the same way we think about local fruits, local vegetables, and local meat? And while Canada's most recent iteration of our nation's food guide pictures Arctic char on its demonstration plate, the Nunatsiavu government withholds some of its own char quota to ensure that char stocks are not overexploited. If the resource base cannot uh, withstand more consumption, why do we have national policies that suggest we should be eating more char, for example? So my hope would be that we can work on change here to support pathways to sustainable oceans and coasts um, and sustainable communities by thinking of fish in the context of sustainable food systems. Our relationships with fish in the oceans are important. Um, our relationships with fish harvesters as food providers are important. For me, sustainable oceans and coasts mean that these relationships are conserved uh, and they're ones that we can nurture and deepen um, through generations. Thank you. And thanks for sharing your comments. So thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a joy of Rashid's talk, of course, and uh, full disclosure, uh, Rashid's on our Oceana board. We've <laughs> 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 had uh, many interactions over the years, and very uh, productive and enlightening ones. Um, and uh, so uh, I'd like to just say a little bit from an NGO perspective, and maybe it's, you've all some, had some engagement with environmental groups, no doubt. Um, I'll say a little bit about who we are and what we do as Oceana, and then sort of tie in some of our policy work with, um, with the comments of Sheets made. Um, so we are, we, we're relatively new in Canada, we've been here since 2015. We are the largest global NGO working solely, solely on the oceans. Uh, like me personally, I'm a research scientist who joined WWF back in 2021 or 2001, and <laughs> and uh, and worked there for 14 years before uh, starting at the beginning of Oceana here in Canada. We're a campaigning organization. We focus our uh, policy objectives in countries, even though we work around the world. Um, what I found was interesting that the first choice of articles that she put out there was that when you did in, what year was that? That was in 2015? Yeah, so that's when we started Oceana. And that's significant because um, it plays up right till present day. So I'll tell you a little story that links to our campaign activities since 2015 that ties directly into some of this, and then I'd like to end uh, throw it back to Rashid and some of his work and uh, his uh, wonderful book, Infinity Fish. Please get it, it's, it's amazing. 
Um, so when we started in 2015, we asked a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, what's the status of Canada's fish stocks? And how are we managing them? And we could not find that information anywhere. So we, um, as a result of quite a lot of pressure, in Rarico and many others, uh, what resulted was when the new Liberal government came in in 2016, we had a um, an openness for transparency, which then allowed us to have access to federal government data in a way that we wasn't readily available. Uh, and so what we did with that is uh, created an annual fishery audit. And uh, we're now doing our sixth annual fishery audit that tells us the state of our fisheries in Canada and the um, indicators for management performance. I won't go into that in any detail now. Uh, suffice to say, at this point, we can verify that about 30% of our fish stocks are healthy according to our precautionary framework that the DFO uses. The, the question that comes out of that is why do we have such a legacy of collapsed fishes, fish stocks? And um, a very poor performance in terms of efforts to rebuild them. I'll remind everyone this year is the 30th anniversary of the COD moratorium. And um, there's much we could have done to turn that around in the early days uh, or before it collapsed. Um, and we're still continuing to fish it. It's fishery started on a stewardship fishery in 2007. The point is, what are, the, what are the means behind that? And one of the questions comes to the other uh, major effort that went on around the same period was the uh, revision of the Fisheries Act. It's the oldest piece of legislation. And what it allows is essentially unfettered discretionary power of the fisheries minister. So as you can imagine, and you probably know that I'm aware that often happens, it's a lot of political pressure on ministers to um, uh, reward constituencies with more fish. So this is what Rashid talked about in his book about front end voting the benefits and paying up the, the, uh, the future costs and downloading those essentially to our branch and future generations. So at that time, uh, we and a number of others worked very hard to get uh, fisheries rebuilding into the new Fisheries Act. And um, that was passed in 2019. Uh, it didn't actually apply to any stocks because the regulations hadn't been formulated. Um, and just last month, we now have seen the first set, the set of regulations in the first batch of stocks to which those regulations will apply. So why this is significant is now we have as a law that we must rebuild stocks that are in the critical zone as defined by uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Precautionary Framework. And we think that's very significant because even though the minister still has discretionary power and has some off ramps under the regulations and the act, it very clearly puts a, a, a effort or a requirement to re start to rebuild our, our fisheries. And so I was reflecting on the importance of that and we still have a lot of work to do is to continue to rebuild the fisheries. Uh, and looking at, you know, reading Rashid's book and sort of asking this question about um, an important part that he did, and we, we did some work with Rashid and what he's saying, looking at sort of intergenerational um, discounting. Discount, yes, sorry, intergenerational discounting. I don't know what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and how important that is. So, I, you know, I think this question that was posed to us by Redmond is around pathways to success, and we've seen that now working on a legal requirement, uh, getting all the good work that's done by DFO scientists actually happening in the uh, in a timely, time-bound manner, which is you know, two years to get a voting plan in place, starting to address the, some of the ecosystem uh, components of uh, rebuilding, such as our forage initiative. There is, there is a pathway here, and I think a bit of a message of Oh, um, but there's still a whole component that's not included. And I guess I would leave this question of 
two major things that came out of um, Rashid's talk and comments that Megan made is how do we how do we address this interjust generational valuation like leaving more for future generations, bringing in the um, the uh, indigenous knowledge systems as part of our decision making, and I'll remind people there is this concept in, uh, in First Nations around the seven generation principle, which is essentially the same thing. Let's leave something for our children, grandchildren, and their grandchildren. Um, and so I'm not seeing yet, and there's so sort of, there's the pieces, there's a strong case, the economic case, the partnerships with indigenous communities, reconciliation agreements that are not <coughs> delivering, but are sort of poised to deliver. Um, I think it gives us a chance now to start to look at how we can start to build a more inclusive fisheries rebuilding that doesn't just look at stocks. It starts to address uh, decision making across uh, 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 the contributions we can get from communities in our indigenous communities. And then, of course, we have to address the climate change. And that's the big challenge. So that's, we're moving now, seeing how policy can work for rebuilding fish stocks, but we have to address these, uh, sort of these sustainability paths in a sea of change. So addressing the sea of change component to it, which I think the most important part of that, of course, is the climate change and the reconciliation agenda. responsible for uh, managing all the fish across Canada as well as meeting all of our international commitments. And well, the first thing that struck me was I read the program and it said, provide feedback to what Rashid has said. And so we're living up to our stereotypes because Megan came incredibly prepared as an academic yeah. and me as government, I'm reacting. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did, I did, in re, your, your talk really did, it was very inspiring from, from many uh, different aspects. The first was the, the role of, of global assessments, the role of, of, of global agreements, global commitments, and how that translates down to national and regional and local initiatives. So as an example, uh, with Fisheries and Oceans, we, um, or, or Canada in general, uh, signed on to Convention of Biological Diversity. We commit ourselves to the Fisheries Code of Conduct. So we commit ourselves to all of these international commitments, and that actually provides fisheries notions with a lot of structure. And a lot of, if there are targets, it's even better. That provides us with targets, and then that directs research, and it sort of trickles down. So that sort of global to national to local uh, really does, um, does help, or does re it really works. Uh, one of the other things that I was reflecting on was actually something you said, the anniversary of the, um, of the COD collapse, and I was reflecting on how much fisheries and oceans as an agency, and some of us are here, how much that has changed, how much the community within uh, fisheries and oceans and our research scientists have changed. There's uh, allies doing incredible work. Uh, trying to get socioeconomic stuff into uh, fisheries and ocean, and it's been a hard battle. She, she will tell you about that. <laughs> but it also made me think we've had this this rapid transformation, but it's nowhere near the rate of change of all the problems that are on top of that. So while we've had to change, so has the world. So the sea of change, that actually is a faster rate than we are able to change. To that end, we've reached out a lot uh, to have collaborations with universities, and it's proved very, very useful. Andrea, I'm not going to pronounce your name right. Rickman <laughs> <laughs> uh, just published a uh, sort of a, a, a roadmap for fisheries and oceans to follow to consider climate change in the establishment of marine protected areas. 
So all of these collaborations really help us to move forward and to meet our international commitments, and those international commitments are always uh, from a good place. They're always about leave no one left behind. So all of the sort of the small scale stuff comes along with it. So that that was those were my initial reflections. And also I have to mention that when Megan Bailey, I have never met Megan Bailey, but that 2015 paper, yeah. uh, you could see us all cheering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it also was very roadmap, very specific, very target. So these are these are easily translated into uh, targets and things that we can go after. So uh, from a government perspective, if things are rational and, and specified with targets and well laid out, these are easy to, to sort of logically argue into as they climb up into the fishery sustainability survey, etc. So there are there is a lot of there is a lot of room for input, a lot of room for uh, diverse views in, in how the in how the government responds. My only fear, I guess, is that we can't move fast enough with our capacity uh, as fast as the world is changing. So the well, which will lead me right into climate change. The, the climate change issue for us, we have uh, recently established, or 2018, uh, a DFO NOAA uh, fishery science collaboration and also ocean, acidification, ocean acidification collaboration. And that's in recognition that our ecosystems at both of our international borders are crossing. So here the Hague line and in the Pacific. So there are groups for the Pacific, the Arctic, and uh, Atlantic Canada, and we sort of join forces and decide on um, collaborative projects together. So that would call under a uh, joint monitoring, that would call in, uh, uh, come under a uh, mechanistic research, and then the applied research. What do we do once we have found an indicator of a fish crossing the border? How does that translate down? So the, the science part is, is certainly being, um, uh, well, addressed at a, at, at a pace, at our pace. Um, the, that should then feed into a process to set up some sort of legal or governance issue between the two countries, but that may be a while away. Uh, there is the track now. We do have we do have um, we do have a uh, an instrument in how to uh, deal with shared fish stocks, but we only have three in that particular uh, in, on the Atlantic coast, and there are other animals that are moving. Halibut, for example, is is one animal that is expanding. Uh, to warming water, and it's also it is currently um, uh, threatened under the uh, species uh, endangered species act in the U.S. But it's the MSC certified in Canada, and that's just right across the line. So you've got MSC certified and endangered. Mm -hmm. So a group of scientists we've all got together to discuss how do we uh, learn everything we can about the spatial ecology of halibut to push that science forward to use as evidence. <coughs> to go forward into management. And I've probably talked a lot right now, so I'll just close. I just want to check my notes. There's one other thing. There were questions I did have for you. Um, I was very interested, like there was a lot of there was a lot of information that you had done globally on on subsidies. Has that same exercise been done for Canadian fisheries in terms of harmful subsidies or or has the ocean accounting been done within Canada? Are there are there stats on that or information on that? And they're all closed. I'll close with a question. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. to uh, you know, put the different perspectives together and addressing a very big question. But I think we've done well, you know, in one evening, you imagine, four people presenting lots of ideas about what we need to do in order to, to go forward in that path to sustainability. I mean, the work that the kids said, um, you know, bringing really positive messages, for instance, or really look at big picture, thinking about uh, doing something, I would say, a bit daring, like you've got to be bold enough, right, to take on such big issues. And Rajin has shown many different ways to do that. And I can present that uh, in addition to, to that, uh, thinking about asking for, you know, questions about conservation, for instance, in a very different way, have to be basically based on many other principles, including inclusiveness and justice. And what, uh, what Bob showed us about uh, what the 
that part of the machine now. It's about really doing that work into it as well, which is to take, you know, to take issue with, with uh, serious issues with these, you know, these audits actually takes up. You, you take a lot of, you, you get a lot of credit for doing that, but also people are really talking a lot about that. So it, it's being, you know, it's being, you get attention. So it's about raising the visibility of the issue, right? That people believe in it or that they say about it. But at least it brings people to the conversation, which I think is very good. And I, I have been, uh, uh, have a privilege of being uh, able to participate with what they are doing in terms of broad area collaboration. So I think you know, the, the step towards bringing more social science into this whole and also reaching out to various uh, sectors, including groups that people not also very engaged with. So I think we all stepping in the right direction. And, uh, you know, so it's, like I say, amazing that we can see these pathways um, seem, like, seem like we are on the right track, I would say. Although we might have other questions too. So, question to Rashid, uh, we already have from Nancy, so you can answer that, or whatever you like, I wanted to uh, reflect back on what the, the, the discussant said, and we find as well. I also want to invite, um, you know, after we hear from Rashid, then we open up for the audience here. I don't know who's monitoring the the, the, the live, uh, whether there will be any question from the audience from YouTube or not, I really don't know. Oh, but, yeah. yeah? Sure. Somebody would be monitoring that. Okay, so please, audience are online, uh, feel free to also post your question. So, Rashid, uh, how yeah. uh, do you have a point to say? So, I think this is working, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's on. Yeah. So thanks for your additions. <laughs> technology confuses. <laughs> Who cares about technology? You want to talk ideas, right? Anyway. So thanks very much for your comments. I mean, it's beautiful, right? You have four people and diverse people, like you said, government, you have NGO, you have academic, and it was just good to listen to you different takes on this and add into what, what I had. So what I will do is, Megan, uh, thanks for mentioning the book and mentioning the indigenous chapters. I think when the book comes out, that will be the highlight, one of the highlights if not the main highlight of the book. Ross Jones is uh, is actually cheap uh, in uh, uh, Hyderabad. It's uh, in Hyderabad, if you can. It's really amazing with the science and fisheries and science and so on. So, thanks for bringing that. I didn't say much about the book because we are waiting for the second review of the book. We got the first review, it's excellent. We're just waiting for the second one. Hopefully, it comes soon. And uh, I hope it will publish next year. I think. There is a lot in the different chapters. We, mainly the team is changing changing oceans. So changing oceans and then changing bodily ecology, changing oceans, changing access, who gets the fish, and now we have changing oceans and then changing governments. So these are the three core parts of the book and we'll get to hear more. Uh, oh, yeah, you read the book? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned intergenerational discounting, which is actually at the core of the book. And essentially, I started thinking of this, just thinking in this way, to give you a little bit of context so that we can follow up with what you said, because more needs to be done. So I said, imagine you have two people. You are here, so I'm here. Um, my granddaughter is coming in the future. I don't have one yet, but who knows, they will be coming soon. <laughs> so you have my granddaughter, who is not here, that is going to come. And I like fish, and she likes fish. So imagine you ask me, do I have fish in the ocean? You are here. How do you want us to manage this fish? It seems to me that if you're thinking purely on economic basis, I want the fish now, right? Which is what we are doing actually, we just taking the fish. So 
they are front loaded in one patient. But she who is to come, if she could tell us, she said, no, leave the fish there. Wait until I come. When I come, then I take it, right? So thinking about herself. So and if you are here and you are trying to moderate, which I think we want to do, our governments, the policy says we are managing this for all generations, first nation, seven generation idea. Then you want to moderate this. So that was the role I took. I said, okay. She wants everything to wait for her. We want this now. How do we find the middle ground? You know? And so, through playing with data, what I realized is the main problem with the way economists discount future benefits is that we use we, we are the reference. Today is the starting point. And we order the whole of time according to us today, right? So I term this having one discounting clock. Starts with me and goes into the future. But actually, if you think the way I started, maybe the next generation will say, no, 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 don't use your discounting clock to discount my fish. Use my own. So when I appear, that is when my time starts. Don't use your own. And each generation will do that. So that is the thing behind our theory of discount. So I'm not saying don't discount because it's a human thing. If you want your money, you can invest in your company to go to school and not work. And don't take your granddaughter's fish. That you can hide. It's also like property rights, right? So, so that's why we formalized in the model and then came up with a new formula, which we hope will take over the economic profession. I'm dreaming because the mainstream economists are very entrenched in this. So it's going to be a lot of work to move. But that is the whole idea, so you, you kind of capture it. So we have a discounting flow for each generation as they come and they formalize it. And so, yes, so that's something we, we can find a way to make this popular. And there's a lot of years for this. People are looking for a solution. Uh, I'm going to the, to the practical on Ocean Day, June 8. Uh, the, 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 Catholic Church for some reason love this idea. Every time there's somebody in the room, they want to put me in front of. Uh, there's one guy wanted to take me to the annual meeting of uh, bishops of the USA. Huh? That would have been funny, right? It's a white wall, but I'm in front, you know. So, yeah, and now the, the Vatican is actually asked to hear about this idea. So, there's a lot of traction. You just have to get hold of it properly. So, the main is something to what you're saying. Now, Nancy, thank you for your intervention. You're the one who reacted to it. The scientists don't do it. They just do what they like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was, that was I had no idea what you were going to say. So no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> we love what you did. Because it's good. I mean, you expanded and, and, and talked about good stuff. And so it's just nice to see Nancy doing the job. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, you, you have a number of good points, targets. And you're the first person I hear, a government person, who really says, look, this global thing we do, where the world needs and says targets is a good thing. Most people like guess, in the developing world, I have to argue with them. And if I say 10% NPA, oh no, I'll punish you. They argue, I say, these are targets. Do your best, right? Nobody say you have to meet it. And actually, like you said, that's the way I see them too. It gives you space. Framework. Framework. Like framework. And also room and cover. So as long well, as the UN decided, we are just implementing, which is also good for us sometimes, right? Because there's all this pressure. So so I noted that and, and I, I kind of like it. Now you talked about how you cannot move fast. So which is true, right? Institutions are it's hard to politics, oh my god. So so in a way you are like the fish, right? Temperature is going, they want to move fast, they can't, then they perish. So watch out. <laughs> you gotta find a way to deal with this. So the question I hope as we were talking is how do you then what do you do when you don't have the ability to move as fast? Right? Good reasons really. We have a nation, right? And there can be good reasons for that. Because you don't want the to be just chopping all the right place. So but then we also know that you can be negative. So what do you do? In, in investment, those in Wall Street and Bay Street, that's why they like diversification, to kind of protect you, right? And here, 
in, in terms of fisheries management. Marine protected areas. This is why I like them. It's like buying insurance, protecting part of your portfolio because there are all uncertainties that the system doesn't move that fast. So at least you have some protection, right? So so that is probably you have to be more cautious when you cannot move as fast as you want. So like, yeah. One, one of the reasons that I mentioned targets is we have specific targets for MPAs, yeah. and that program has moved very fast. Yes, it was an international push, but our targets for rebuilding didn't. Yes. And you can see the difference, right? Exactly. So imagine that we have targets for rebuilding, mm -hmm. then Canada <coughs> will say, look here, yeah, this no. one we got to go, and we go. So yeah. I, I really like them for that. You know, people go after the U.S. I see a lot of value in there, right? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, in a way. Because you don't want a world government. Uh, the more I see people like Putin, I don't like world governments, right? <laughs> Imagine a terrible guy takes over. We will be in trouble. So you want to diversify power. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a good thing. And how can we make it work? That's a good target. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop here just to hear from you asked about specific questions, subsidies. Yes, in now it's a global database, so you go in, you can find the subsidy in Canada is according to our estimate, which is based on government reports and so on. So you will find that. But we haven't done a more detailed study like we did for the US. We did a national study because I have collaborators in, in the US okay. and we work together. So that could be done in Canada. Yeah. So we'll be, yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any comments from the Not very often that we get together, right? So, and ask live questions. Can you please? Yes, please. How do we get the sound to go into the recording? Can people hear? I think that she said that I couldn't repeat the question. Okay. Oh, so I, okay, yeah. I'll try. It might pick up because these things are supposed to do that. Yeah, no, it's not doing it. It will do it? Yeah. Okay, it will do it. Speak louder at it. So, am I the first one to ask? Please, go ahead. Yes, keep going. Yeah, so one of your slides showed fish moving because of pressure from climate change. Yeah. So, I'm wondering if, if there is a risk in fisheries management that management will be addressing symptoms of climate change, symptoms, instead of the actual cause, which is climate change in the first place? Or can the fisheries policy feedback or beneficial effects into climate change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in the, we're, we're at, the first part of that would be a vulnerability assessment to determine which fishes are most, most vulnerable to climate change. We won't worry about the ones that aren't. Uh, we'll take those top three. And there's several different initiatives on the go. One of the initiatives is try to incorporate climate change into the actual stock assessment. So when they decide how many how many fish are going to fish, they run it through a population model. Somehow that modeling has to include climate in it. When temperature's really warm, biomass goes down. When, temp uh, uh, when temperature's really cold, biomass goes up. That idea has to be included. That's one idea, um, of which would be incorpor you know, incorporating climate change into the stock assessment. That's one of the initiatives uh, that we're doing. The other is, uh, at the beginning stages, we don't know what to do about this. Uh, the fish uh, are managed on an area basis, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've got, like, in Southwest Nova, you can fish X amount. In, uh, in mid Nova, you can fix X plus one amount. All of that has to be worked out. And we're not there yet, but I guess, Alida, you might want to comment are we getting there or? We're <laughs> <laughs> so, so. So, so we, we, we are aware of it, we, and we also reach out to other people. The US, uh, this collaboration has worked very well in our favor because they're 10 times as big, 10 times as fast. And they've gone through the same problems, and then we just photocopy, cross up US, Canada. <laughs> 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 oh my God, when it works, right? <laughs> 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 you want to ask the question? I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, I'd just like to ask actually all the panelists. No one's mentioned this yet, but we hear a lot about the blue economy now. Broadening what we do, growth, prosperity from the oceans. So how does your vision, Rashid, and everyone on the panel for the future align with the blue economy? Can we have both? Oh, what no. are the dangers or not? Yeah, and why, well, growth? For example, why focus on the world? But the bigger question is what blue economy and your thoughts, what pathways to sustainability? Let's start with the problem. Alida, <laughs> 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 yeah, I actually I had um, in my little ecosystem based management section here that I was really interested in how DFO would be bringing their EBM framework and their blue economy strategy together to co-constitute solutions. Because I do, I mean, I, you, I, I can't imagine you would want to do a blue economy strategy without some ecosystem based management feeding into that. So I see a real, um, you know, hopefully practical uh, use of your framework that, that you're, you and your team are developing that can, you know, because the blue economy strategy is, is ongoing in development, etc. So I think that's a really good place. Um, it, I mean, I would personally say I do not see blue economy as a pathway to sustainability. I see it as something else, but I don't, I don't think we need a blue economy strategy to have sustainable oceans and coasts, quite honestly. Um, I think it makes it more difficult to have sustainable oceans and Post when development um, and growth is really at the center of that. And I think if we look at UNDRIP, if we look at the Sustainable Development Goals, like there are actually lots of things we could be doing as a country that contribute to these pathways to sustainability. And um, the Blue Economy Strategy is a thing, it's happening, um, but my money is not in that basket in terms of sustainability. I think it offers other things, but maybe not the, the fastest pathway to sustainability. Just very quickly, um, I, th I think we have the blue economy was summed up very nicely with uh, Rashid's example of uh, fish were worth more than diamonds. And I think, uh, you know, rebuilding abundance is got to be the core of our of blue economy. Um, I'm always concerned about the term blue economy because I think it means different things to different people and uh, it's pretty ill defined. Um, but if we look at um, to take our, our, our motto at Oceana, you know, save the oceans, feed the world. And when we talk about rebuilding abundance, yes, it literally means what you do with targets around fish stocks. But we also all know that's not sufficient, so we have to look after the, uh, the ocean. I think that's fundamentally around the health of the ocean. A lot of good work's being done on that, and I think there's some, uh, some good opportunities around the ecosystem mm -hmm. work. And the other part of that, of course, is the research around vegetated habitat. So both the sequestering carbon, but also the contributions of those <coughs> help for us and see the marshes and the other assets going to the health of our oceans. And to me, that part of that living world and rebuilding that abundance is I think, fundamentally not only and there's some great science going on, but it has to kind of reflect back to some of the weather comments too. It's we've got wonderful science being done, lots of opportunities. We're at a really special time right now. Let's not squander those opportunities. Those those opportunities have to actually translate into decision making. And um, how we fish is one of the big decisions that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll agree with the uh, uh, previous two speakers, and I, I guess uh, my initial my initial thoughts were it's it's currently ill-defined, and everywhere you read it, but the blue economy applies to it. So I, I guess the latest article I read would have said that we need to differentiate between uh, the ocean being the last frontier for development. Mm -hmm. Right in terms of ocean technologies uh, and developing those sort of willy nilly, it, 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 it led with there is so much potential for economic growth in the ocean, and we've we've seen how that can run away. That would be my only 
So there should be there should be checks and balances, or at least roadmaps, or better defined uh, the underlying purposes of, of, of uh, no one left behind, or something more grounded in terms of instead of a general statement. But yeah, I I don't know yet. I don't know yet. But I, I do feel it needs some more grounding in who is going to benefit. Yeah, blue economy is a um, new catchword, which is very popular as investors are talking. Uh, when you look at the quite different definitions of it here and there, right? Now, I think one of the sources of this is actually the Pacific Island states, the countries like Havar, small uh, developing country island states. And they were pushing blue economy as a concept to try to capture their interest in making sure that the fish and other ocean economic activities actually benefit them and their countries. So distribution is one, social aspects is one. And they also put in sustainability. So there is a group of people who think of blue economy in that sense. Uh, how do we keep the infinity going on? How it works for people and, and nature. So that's that. Then there is the other people who are mainly the economic growth people. They see this as a new frontier. And there's a lot of money to be made. The potential. My God, we talk about it as if we are just discovering the ocean today. I mean, last week we were on a panel, Genome DC, put up the panel. You know, some of us who are seeing, are seeing the blue economy is, we have been blue economy in forever. I mean, people have been doing this with the ocean forever, right? So that is the kind that can lead to really troubles and sustainability and so But I think the blue economy that is thinking more holistically, saying people, nature, distribution of benefits, we have to do it wisely. So, so that I cannot see some positive aspects. It's the implementation of that really. So I try to make this dichotomy, and which one of them will win in the terminal at all? And we know, as usual, the big economy group people can just capture everything, right? So, so we need to watch out. But there are some good things. One good thing is that it's, fo it's focusing the minds of leaders about what is happening in the ocean, and that can be used, uh, I think, in a, in a positive way if that works. I think we should worry a bit more about the fish because of the climate change that's going on. We should all try to make our e ecological footprints a bit smaller to help. <laughs> <laughs>